that would have been too funny. Okay. So we'll take a deep breath. <laughs> oh, we'll pick up our pencil. That's it. Yep. Notice how, what hand we pick it up in and how we hold it in our fingers and thumb. Maybe we move it around a little. A little feeling of that. How tightly we grip it. As we come down to the paper, do we rest our knuckles on the page or our wrist or our elbow? How we position with our arm to the page? How do we lower the pencil? Do we use our fingers? Do we turn a whole, our whole arm? And when we touch the page, how much pressure? How much force do we push with? Can be anything, just notice. Just try to let, let it go and just let yourself just draw those lines or curves. No judgment about what comes out. Hopefully enjoyment. If it's not fun, yeah, try it a little differently. Notice where maybe if it's not fun, where it's not fun, oh, and maybe you're holding pencil too tight. Maybe you're too worried about what it is you're doing or cost of the paper. Just notice that. Try to be easier about it. Yeah, it should be fun. Go a little faster, a little slower. Yeah, notice the speed you're drawing. Maybe vary that. You can notice your shoulders and your back and the weight on the chair, how your feet are positioned. Yeah, trying to make those comfortable. Maybe those are holding back a little. Maybe those are adding to it. Take a moment, let your awareness expand a little and you see what you're drawing while you're still moving your hand. Yeah, kind of amazing. Look, look what's appeared. If we aren't really trying, what's going to what's going to show up? It can be really amazing. Yeah, so tonight we want to practice a little when we're warming up to draw in silence. That's what we want to notice. So as you're making your marks, letting your hand go, being really easy. Just trying to have some flow and have some fun making the marks at the speed that's comfortable. Let your peripheral awareness just recognize anything that's coming up. A thought an emotion. You can notice that you hear the sound of my voice. Whatever comes up, whatever you notice, once you see it, just let it move away. Try to return back to that flow, attention on the pencil, speed of drawing. See if your awareness sees that silence there. So move away those thoughts, leave some space, some space for quiet. If the thoughts come back, it's cool, it's okay. 
Nothing wrong with that. That's what they thoughts and emotions like to come back. So yeah, that's good. It works. System works. Now you can go. A little more space, a little more quiet. Yeah, so let's draw for a few minutes, just just trying to sit in that quiet and let our let our pencils flow. Yeah, if you've never been in the morning, uh, 11 Eastern to the silent drawing bee, that's that's kind of what it's like, <laughs> but it goes for an hour. If you like drawing in silence, that's a good time for see people as well. But you can do it anytime. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the video that I had posted a link to, which maybe had the 10 minutes or so to watch. Uh, but if not, you'll, I'll be explaining most of it anyway, and you might look at it later. And if you've seen it and you have thoughts or comments, yeah, feel free to hop in when I get to those sections. And hopefully we'll have a little discussion about it. This. Uh, that video uh, is uh, Alan Alda uh, doing a special report. I think it was for Scientific American. He's interviewing Michael Gazzaniga, who's a researcher of uh, brain, the brain, especially uh, patients who've had a special surgery that was given uh, to um, alleviate extreme uh, epilepsy when the when the um, epileptic seizure takes place the there's a kind of a positive feedback loop in the brain as i understand <laughs> that 
gets out of control and creates a seizure. And, uh, and when it's extreme, when this person's having seizures many times a day, one of the treatments is to sever the bundle of nerves that connects the two hemispheres of the brain, which seems completely extreme. Uh, it seems like it would be, uh, the results would be like some kind of lobotomy or something like that. That's when, you, when I first heard it, I thought it would be completely disable a person. And also when someone has sometimes some damage to some small parts of the brain, it causes lots and lots of uh, disability. And that's, uh, so it's amazing that this surgery has any success. But um, if you saw the video, you see there's a person who, who uh, you know, seems like just a, just a person who did, hadn't had the surgery <laughs> talking and, and working and that kind of thing. So it's, I think it's a good document to, to look at uh, there are some disclaimers and there's a lot of follow-up to that work that's happened. And I think it's been about 10 or 12 years since that was published. And uh, Michael Gazanik also published a nice book about this work. And um, one of his co-workers, I think was uh, up for a Nobel Prize, nominated uh, for this kind of brain research. So it's, it's, a lot of it's been very well accepted. One thing that we find out in the course of time looking at this kind of work is that one thing, and one thing we know more about the brain is really adaptive. Uh, so, um, if there's some kind of loss in the brain, a lot of times over time and with some kind of training, the brain can uh, regain function or re rebuild neurons that have that function. Uh, one term they like to use is neuroplasticity. And this is also something that's talked about in meditation, that building the habits, meditative habits, and the patterns of recognizing thoughts arising, recognizing emotions arising, kind of, kind of trains the brain, creates pathways. So in that video, they talk about left hemisphere and right hemisphere quite a bit, and that language is not used quite as much. Sometimes they say dominant and non-dominant hemispheres. But the, um, Part of Michael Gazanaga's work that's widely recognized and still holds up is that there are specialized functions in each hemisphere. Uh, later work, uh, some of his results aren't as um, distinct, but they're done with patients who uh, had the surgery uh, much longer ago than the person in this video had it. So uh, apparently either the nerves can grow back in this bundle, although maybe not as much to create seizures or the separate hemispheres can develop the what what's missing from the other hemisphere. So that, it's not really clear yet which it is, but so it's actually really kind of a small snapshot of sort of a, a patient who's had the surgery recently enough to still have this kind of uh, hemispheric uh, specialty. Uh, so that uh, it's an interesting moment there. <laughs> and um, what I'm looking for is not really to try and make a scientific explanation because we don't, from all I can read, we don't really know enough. But I think what serves us is to look at some kind of um, resemblance or some kind of pattern that we can see in the way that what we discover about how a person's brain works from this kind of extreme case. Uh, and get some ideas from it, stimulate some ideas or give us a way to, to when, we, when we're doing drawing and then we're doing reading, uh, to think about what parts of our brain or how we think even, because maybe it's not even located in a, in a particular place, but patterns of thinking that we have and how we use some patterns of thinking when we're drawing and some patterns of thinking when we're analyzing and how those patterns of thinking relate. So uh, Linda Wright's not here tonight, but she's, she, knows, she knows quite a bit about the brain. So let's we'll see if she would chime in at some point, but um, yeah. If anyone has um, ideas or feelings, I, I know when I use left and right brain uh, that that's not 100% the terminology, but sometimes we do use those terms. Okay, in the beginning of that video, he has Alan all to try to draw shapes. He shows one shape to one eye and one shape to another eye on a screen, and then he has, to, has him try to draw at the same time. And, and he says, what we see is that Alan's hemispheres are connected. 
And in fact, the motor signals get mixed. Like we have one place that's sending motor signals and you're trying to send motor signals to the left and the right hand at the same time. Although if you know Donna Mickelson, who's uh, interviewed on my podcast and is an artist here in the Hudson Valley, she, she's an ambidextrous artist. She calls herself an ambi artist. And there are a number of people that can do work in both hands, sometimes simultaneously, uh, and right backwards with one hand and forward with another. There's lots of uh, these kind of skills that you see. And there's another artist on Instagram called Ambi Artist. So it's not, I think it's not uncommon to see. And in fact, we've had a lot of discussion here about drawing with non-dominant hand. And I draw mostly all of my sketching uh, and, and uh, compositional work is done with the left hand now. And I'll say something about why that's true and why that works for me. Uh, but um, without any kind of training and with just trying right away, if you if you try to do two different shapes with two different hands, yeah, you'll see that that's, you have to either really, really concentrate and really move very slowly. It's very hard to do fluidly. And then you see the person who uh, has the um, split brain uh, and they show one to each eye and then he just draws the shapes because his motor signals are not crossed, not crossing and he has the separate hemispheres sending to each hand. So that's, that's interesting. The thing that uh, Michael Gazanaga found though was that the ability to use motor signals for speech and to form speech uh, was located uh, when the brain is connected in one hemisphere. Uh, and that was uh, where his research focused. So he would show, uh, you saw that he would show one word and he had an arrangement on the screen where the person would focus in the center of the screen uh, so that um, one signal would go to one eye or a signal that went to one eye would not go to the other eye. So it would go to one hemisphere and not the other hemisphere. So he would show a word to the hemisphere of the brain that had the uh, motor skills and abilities to talk and the person would say the word. You probably all saw that in the video. And then he would show it to the other hemisphere uh, and the person would say, and we'd have to think the hemisphere of the brain that had verbal skills would say, I didn't see anything. And so we would say that's the person saying that. But in fact, in this case, that was the hemisphere that had the verbal skills saying that. But when the hand that was connected to the hemisphere that didn't have the verbal skills was given a pencil and, and asked to just let go and draw. And here's the first resonance with our practice is that uh, when we do improvisational drawing and we do sort of meditative drawing uh, or we get into the flow of drawing, yeah, we just kind of let go and draw. When the hand that's connected to the nonverbal side of the brain is given that opportunity, it draws out a picture and another remarkable thing is that they don't flash to that hemisphere a picture. They flash a word. So in the case of the video, they put the word phone. And then the hand drew a picture of a phone. So for one thing, the hemisphere that doesn't have the verbal skills has all the listening skills because it knows what it's being asked to do. And it knows how to read, it knows how to take that word and convert it into a picture, which is also kind of fascinating. That means that any um, signs that you might see or peripheral things uh, that you might pat when you're driving in a car, billboards or signs and words on buildings, or if you're scanning documents and text, that can all be going into the, your uh, unconscious that, and, and interpreted and understood and come up later as imagery. Um, and he also drew the phone in a kind of a con outline contour way. It'd be really interesting to know if uh, the person had any kind of tr drawing training because I thought that the shape that he made, he did draw the kind of the hand handset. And also he drew kind of an old fashioned phone. It'd be really interesting to see what would happen now if you flashed phone and if it would be a flip phone. Or, Anyway, there's a lot. There's a lot to sort of tease out about that. 
the, the kind of contour drawing was also very interesting and it, it makes you wonder if the uh, nonverbal brain that's doing this kind of image processing sees more in contour than shade. These kind of questions come up. And then, uh, yeah, Julie? What do you mean by con drawing in contour? I'm sorry, I just don't even know what that term is. That's okay. Is. He, he didn't draw like the parts of the phone to begin. He didn't draw the handset and the dial and the, he just drew the outline, I'd say that, the outline of the phone. But you can see the outline is a kind of a 3D shaped outline. He didn't, like he didn't make the mistake of a beginning drawing student to, to try and, it wasn't like he overthought the shape. I guess what I'm saying is like the part of the brain that might overthink the shape and rationalize the shape and interfere with the way we draw that would take away that uh, shaped contour may be the part of the verbal brain. That may be that we convince ourselves somehow rationalizing that the top of a jar is a circle rather than an oval because we don't rely on our senses. And so what I saw in the contour was, yeah, that that that, that layer of, uh, of uh, internal dialogue was kind of missing in that. I don't know if that's universally true, but I did see that in that sketch. Uh, that's a good question, yeah. Uh, so there he was drawing, he drew the phone, saw the word phone, drew the phone, and then uh, the verbal part of the brain is looking at what the nonverbal hand is doing, and then he says phone out loud, he says it. Then he's able to put a, a word to it. So I wonder what the self the verbal self is thinking when he sees his picture appear from the other hand. <laughs> but this is the sense when I draw with the non-dominant hand, when I draw with my left hand, I, that's the, the feeling I get is watching another person draw. And I wonder if the, this is the feeling that this person get watch, watching his own hand draw because he, he doesn't know in the verbal side and the ra rational, rational side, um, what the word is, apparently he doesn't know that there's a phone and then he sees it and, and they were remarking in the video how it took uh, the person just about as long as it took them to recognize what it was that was being drawn. Like he didn't have any necessary clue about what it was. And that was kind of interesting. And then he says, uh, yeah, the verbal brain figures it out. And he says, what we have here is a picture of someone communicating almost with another person. And then Michael Gazzaniga says that about four minutes, one of the more important things in the video, he says, the communication is not occurring in the head. It's occurring out on a piece of paper. And I think this is so important to understanding uh, the reading of the drawing and what, why it's so, so interesting to do, that there's something about having it take place outside of the head that, that expands it and enriches it. And if you were to just see the story and tell the story to yourself, because you do have this kind of communication all in your mind and your thoughts are going back and forth and your hemispheres are communicating. And so your, your verbal brain is not getting a voice. <laughs> the verbal side's getting a voice. And sometimes it gets kind of mushed up. If you, if you just have people talk about it, but also if you, if you think about when you imagine drawing something uh, and then you actually uh, sit down to draw it, how different it, it is. There's a big difference in like the thing you think you're gonna draw or what you think it might look like. And when you actually put it on paper, there's a big difference in the kind of reduction of sensor, sensory influence because your brain is very active sending signals all around. There's a very rich, uh, um, no, no, there, there are things that can't be conveyed on paper that are going on. Then it kind of comes down onto paper. Uh, and then when you see it, it goes back in and it kind of ch changes the sense of it. So when you're just imagining it, it gets all kind of mushed and flattened together that way. And then when you draw it out, uh, creates a more of a feedback loop. So yeah, the communication occurring on a piece of paper and then get back into the mind. So only after seeing what the right hemisphere is drawing can the verbally exclusive left hemisphere name it. And this is also uh, reminiscent of a lot of, a lot of Buddhist teaching. 
uh, some in uh, also in uh, Hindu teaching and uh, goes under the uh, uh, description of Nama Rupa, name and form. And it's an ancient distinction that there's this division. Uh, spiritual presence and physical presence is one the uh, one way it's divided or abstract thought, visual thought, or words and images. It's all, so it's kind of like in uh, uh, Buddhist teaching, when we see the world and then we see the spirit, this uh, somehow this division of uh, names and forms or, or things and abstract ideas around them, we call it, that can be the language part and the, and the um, object can be the visual part. It's sort of, Deep, deep into our, it's deep into the uh, spiritual thinking, but it may be coming from the way our anatomy is, the way our brains are physically connected, may be somehow influencing the way we think, may somehow be influencing the arising of these concepts uh, from people who spend a lot, a lot of time doing introspection and looking at, looking at their own thoughts and looking at the world. So this putting things out into physical form, naming them and bringing them back in and trying to understand uh, where they came from and also how they're uh, affecting us and where they can guide us is, is, a, is a, really a reflection of that process. I'll read you something that I found about Nama Rupa. The conception of Nama Rupa, name and form, is that of a complex is that of the complex of worldly reality in essence differentiated contingent existence so our our idea of ourselves as a separate thing is is tied up in name and form it pertains to the differentiation of the original infinite unity so so name and form is about seeing ourselves separate from the original universe there's a related term, Dharma Rupa, that presents the same conception but expresses the contrast between the original unity uh, and its differentiation. Okay. Going through my notes here. Okay, so uh, the next important part of that video uh, for me was when he does this kind of classic experiment uh, of showing um, a pictures and having someone choose uh, from a group of pictures. So he shows he shows the word uh, music and then. Uh, to the verbal uh, brain and the verbal brain says music. And then he shows uh, the word bell to the nonverbal brain. And um, there, are, there are better choices for that word, but he picks, uh, he picks the, for, there are better choices for music, but he picks the picture of the bell. And then he, the most important part is he makes up a story to explain that difference. There's another uh, one where uh, they show the, verbal brain, a picture of a chicken's foot, like the uh, claw of a chicken, and then they show him a bunch of animals. And so the verbal brain picks the, picks the chicken to go with the chicken foot. And then they show the nonverbal brain uh, a picture of um, a uh, snowstorm, a snow scene, and there's a snow shovel there. And so the nonverbal brain points to the snow shovel. So there you have one hand pointing to a chicken foot and the other pointing to a snow shovel. So the verbal brain knows why it's pointing to the chicken foot, but it sees the other hand pointing to the snow shovel, but it hasn't seen the snow scene. It doesn't know that. And they ask the person, uh, why are you pointing to the shovel? And the person says, oh, well, to clean up after the chicken. So he's, He's confabulated a story uh, out of 
apparent evidence, but uh, you know, not having known the origin of the pointing, just m made it up. And so I, that's why I think the making up the story part is an interesting uh, aspect of the reading of the drawing because this kind of nature of confabulation, our need to explain the, the evidence that we see in terms of the story is another thing that's baked in that's, that's inherent to our, the way our brains work. If you've ever uh, uh, been around children, this is very common <laughs> to see. It's very easy to see when when something happens, and then yeah, they have to they have to make an explanation. They're very quick to make stories, but it happens all the time. It happens even in politics. People make up stories all the time. <laughs> uh, to explain the evidence, but even scientists, you know, if they if they do experiments. Uh, they'll, they'll take lots and lots of data and then what happens? They have to kind of come up with a story for how that data fits together. They have to come up with a theory, which is, a, which is an elaborate way of saying a story that fits the evidence. And that's really what our minds are good at. It's probably why we're good at science. It's probably why we're good at storytelling because that's one way our mind works, that we have to, we have to make things okay in the world somehow. And you can see, uh, it has something to do with, well, we take in information in all sorts of ways. And even though our verbal brain and our sort of dominant consciousness wants to think it's the only thing in our head and the only thing in charge and be able to explain everything, we're getting information and impressions and uh, emotions and, and all sorts of feedback in, from all our senses, but in all sorts, all parts of our brain and especially the visual brain. So. Um, when we get to that part of the reading where we've already described the physical nature of the work and we've described uh, you know, our sensory uh, input from the work and we get to the storytelling and the emotions. That's, and so, so you can see how we're moving through uh, the, I'd say sections or portions of the brain and different ways it can react. Uh, and trying to see where that information is folded or where information is being hidden, that kind of thing. So when he goes through and he uh, makes that story, he says, well, it's really like a person having a conversation with themselves. And that's how I feel about the reading. That's gonna be, reading a drawing is really you having a conversation with yourself. And I think the why of reading a drawing is that by letting go and quieting the verbal mind, as we were trying to do in the warm up, and just letting those thoughts and emotions sort of move away and moving into flow is giving more power to the nonverbal. And even being able to work with non dominant hand for me gives even more. Uh, rain and it and it's kind of a confidence builds there like you're acknowledging this presence this person this this self inside there who uh maybe doesn't get much of, of a voice or sometimes has to come out one way or the other it comes out as a, a emotional outburst or it comes out as a, as a acting out in the kids or it comes out in in a, suddenly you want to decorate something or you have to buy something or, Sometimes there's these impulses that come from uh, the feelings that are built up in the nonverbal parts that, that are not getting voice through the verbal parts. Sometimes people say, well, I feel like I'm of two minds. And I think that also kind of reflects that. Like you have a gut feeling, you have an emotional or a nonverbal feeling. And then you have like a story that you're trying to satisfy and you can't quite get the two congruent. And so, uh, Sometimes if you let that part that doesn't have words, because the nonverbal part doesn't have words, how does that nonverbal part speak? How does that nonverbal part get that information out? One way is to transmit it through the drawing. If you can just get the mind to quiet down, if you can let the muscle of mindfulness work for you and just kind of let the words quiet, it doesn't have to be a you know, beautiful picture. When you see that video and you see him draw the phone, uh, yeah, it's kind of, they're kind of crude drawings and yet they, they work, they serve the purpose. So yeah, just let the thing come out and then 
we'll do our interpretation and let the non uh, let the verbal parts have their say. And uh, sometimes that can bring more congruence. Sometimes that can really show you. So when I started uh, reading the drawing seriously and regularly, uh, I started to I started to think that I was um, like seeing the future. <laughs> There was a there was a character in um, it was a TV show called Heroes, and there was a character named Isaac Menendez. Probably nobody saw this show now; it's been off the air for a long time. But every, all all the all the um, characters in Heroes uh, had some sort of superpower, but nobody quite knew why. Anyway, Isaac Menendez lived in a studio in a city, probably New York City, and he had all his paints and his canvases and things like that. And he would go into this trance and his eyes would roll up back and up into his head and, and he wouldn't remember anything and he would paint and he would paint and he would paint. And then when he finished, there'd be this scene and it was the future. That was like the thing that was gonna happen in the future. It was like doing divination <laughs> with this. And well, when I started reading the drawing, I started to see things that, uh, that I felt like well, maybe that's, uh, I drew patterns and then I saw patterns break apart. I drew uh, towers and I saw towers fall. I was doing all the reading. Uh, of course, uh, easy to explain or rationalize because, uh, yeah, they were either uh, things that uh, I have, was anticipating or had anxiety about, or they were things that um, I wanted to have happen. And so I was moving myself in a way to make them happen. There are a lot of, a lot of reasons. But, and when I started I, I clock in 2008, I called it divination drawing. That's, I think that's still the title of it, divination drawing. Uh, and at that time, I did a lot of research into what divination was because I, because I saw it as like the stereotype of divination is uh, like, a, uh, you know, like fortune teller or tarot reader or someone with a crystal ball. That's a kind of, that's, that's a, the, uh, someone who sees the future. But in fact, divination has, more established roots, and if you go past the stereotypes of divination, uh, uh, one thing is that people use a use a um, a stick to find water. I don't know if you ever seen someone like that. Someone will use a forked stick, and they'll try to find water. That's called a diviner's rod. Uh, and in fact, what they're trying to do is not see the future, but they're trying to uncover the unseen. And so that's one connotation of divining: is not predicting the future, but uh, when you divine the essence of something, when you look into something. And so the divination drawing uh, has that aspect, that you're looking into what is trying to be expressed, what you're trying to express to yourself, that the chatter in your head is too noisy to let yourself hear. And so you can uh, try to divine that information by just letting, we could do it through music. I had a student once who was a musician and he would play and then we would talk about the mood of the music and it would uh, cue him into what his mood was. Well, you can imagine. And in poetry, the same thing will work. If you let yourself loose and you put down words, you might actually find out what your mood is because you might be using words that describe it. I don't know if I can, Wendy will confirm that for me, but <laughs> something similar. Yeah, that flow of that, yeah, good. That flow of consciousness can happen in many forms. So that's a kind of a divination. That's a kind of a way of getting underneath the surface of the default mode network, chattering mind, always busy, always thinking, always entertaining ourselves, always online kind of thing. And just kind of like get back to a little more base, basic feeling. That's a really good reason to draw and to, and to read the drawing. Uh, and then uh, as I kept researching divination, because it's actually unfolds into quite an interesting topic, uh, it turns out uh, uh, that there is a connection also to divine. When you think about it, divination is connected to the divine, and so something about going back into the unseen is getting back into your true nature or into your godlike nature cases. Uh, and there's a there's a scene in Bhagavad Gita in chapter 11 when it's a, the, sort of the climax of Bhagavad Gita when uh, when Arjuna is uh, allowed to glimpse when Krishna his chariot driver allows him to glimpse God and it, and it's a majestic scene in the story uh, but in order to do it he cannot see. Uh, he cannot see God with his own eyes or his own senses. It's beyond his senses. And so he has to be given a special power. 
And so Krishna empowers him what's, with what's called a divna, divna drishti. It's a, it's a power of divination. He's, he's given the power to see the divine. So it's kind of a really interesting reflection of like what it is you're getting into when you start to open up. Uh, and as I said last week, sometimes you're just getting a reading of your own emotional state at the moment. Sometimes there's something that's been on your mind for a while that's bothering you. Sometimes it's a longer term thing that you've thought about. Uh, and sometimes as we unpack and unwind and allow and open up, there's glimpses of, you know, uh, larger themes, longer term uh, uh, wisdom that comes out. And so that's another good reason to read. Not only can you sort of heal and unpack, but you can, uh, you can, yeah, you can get to things that will, you know, teach you something, help you, help you see. It has for me, at least. Okay, so that one's went on a little longer than I thought. That, that video is a favorite of mine. I think it introduces the, some really great uh, topics about how we think. And, and because it's a kind of a, you know, a very kind of snapshot of a moment, it, uh, uh, it, it, it gives us a nice way to um, reflect on what's going on in our own minds. So let me open up. Uh, uh, yes, question. What, what the video is, just I want to write it down. The okay. You're speaking of. Yeah. So uh, if you go to um, YouTube mm -hmm. and you uh, go into the search and you look for Michael Gazzaniga, G A Z Z A N I G A. Yeah, Michael Gazzaniga. And if you type, uh, if you just type Gazzaniga and Alan Alda. Okay. But it is linked on our Facebook page. But if you're not on Facebook, I can I can also no, send it to I, you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, you can find it there. Uh, and there are many videos from Michael Gazzaniga, and there's sort of several uh, cuts of that video. But that's the the one I posted. I think is the best edit of it. Uh, John, I have a question. Great. Do you okay. have any um, suggestions for any more resources on uh, what you were talking about, Nama Rupa, the name and the idea of name and form? Yeah. What would be a good, what would be good to read or see about that? Yeah, one, one place, uh, you know, Audio Dharma, do you know that site? Okay. Yeah, if you want to put on a, a talk, a lecture, talk about it, which is, I kind of like to have it on when I'm drawing sometimes oh, yeah. or driving, what have you. Yeah, there are a number, if you type Nama Rupa in, uh, in uh, Audio Dharma, I think there are a number of talks there. Okay, great. But even going right to, uh, right to Google, which is, which of course, everybody's default first. <laughs> it's not really research, but look up. I get you there. Uh, this, <laughs> Wikipedia is, has some, but then there's some other sites. And you'll find, interestingly, you'll find Buddhist and Hindu sites, and there'll be some slight differences. So you kind of have to choose. But uh, I, I'm a big fan of Advaita Vedanta, which is the kind of uh, pre-Hindu teachings. Right. And they, they talk about it as well. This whole name and form thing is really interesting in the reading, too, because we make the form and then we assign it a name. And in the, in the video, he draws the form, he draws the phone, and then he gives a name to the phone. And so, and things change when they get a name, they get reduced in a yeah. certain way. Uh, and I think that's, and the, and the uh, what we try to break out of when we learn to draw is to take away the name, right? We ha what we have to do is suppress that part that's trying to say what it is. Well, as soon as we stop thinking about what it is and we look at it and we look at the shapes and we look at the textures, then our, our drawing improves. So we have to really go to the form, back into the form. Uh, and yeah, that's- Yeah, I find that really, I find that whole idea really interesting in, in I mean, in, in life, but also in terms of drawing, because I think if you've been drawing for a long time, it's easy to kind of get stuck in a name place rather yeah i don't know how to put that exactly but i'm curious to, i'm curious to find out more about that so thank you yeah that's all it's kind of the idea behind beginner mind as well it's, right uh, it, it, that we we get we get uh we get um in a groove with our meditation that we we, we know oh you got to sit for 15 minutes i'm going to think about my uh, shopping list for five of them and then i'm going to hum for three you know we get through it we stop actually quieting everything down and so we want to make it fresh and so yeah we get a style 
and we, right. we can draw a bottle and we draw the bottle and we know how to do the whole bottle and we know how to shave. It's great. Nobody likes it. We can sell it or whatever, but we forget to look again. And so it's, it's a, and that's, and that we see that we see it in our, in our mind, but we're very uh, dominated by information. And, and also now, uh, you could say that five years ago, now I'd say we're just dominated by um, screens in general, just bombarded with entertainment even. <laughs> really I hard. like your, your distinction also um, that we're bombarded by that sort of verbal information stream, but that other information stream is a lot of times really cut off, partly because we're so bombarded with the other one. So. Yeah, I think I think of that that uh, I don't I don't really want to get into Carl Jung, but he said <laughs> he talked about the surprising thing is that there are multiple intelligences, you know, multiple autonomous intelligences going on in our mind, and we need to we should have to recognize it. We think we're, we're one smart person or we're one thinking person, but the nonverbal creative mind is is bright enough to read and form images. We, we see that in that video, but also uh, I find like very timid, kind of shy, like it, by putting out creative work, vulnerable thing. And so I think that that, that intelligence doesn't really want to be drawn out. Like you, you really have to be quiet and patient and listen to get it to come out. And, and so that's another place where I think that Mind, mindfulness practice and the muscle of mindfulness is helpful, really helpful in being creative. Because for one thing, yeah, it quiets it quiets the inner critic, it quiets the voices, but but it but it makes space for and allows for and helps you meet that creative self, and let it come out and and support it. And then when you you know you do something and you get a feedback and you see the meaning comes in there, you get more confidence. That creative self gets confident. But I, for me at least, it's never gotten any less shy or any less vulnerable. Hmm. <laughs> I'm still super vulnerable showing stuff. Interesting. That's good to know. Okay, so any other questions on that or the reading or really looking back, we're at another changeover this week. So if anyone has any questions along the way about practice. I could probably Google this, but I it's it's a definition thing again, John. Um, what is the difference between drawing and rendering? Yeah, good. My own uh, uh, distinction is rendering is when your uh, when your your intention is to um, is to duplicate on the paper the visual input that you're that's come that you're you know what you're seeing. Okay. Okay. That you're you're going to render a scene. It means you're going to try try and uh, um, create on the paper, the bottle, or the jar, or whatever you see. Drawing is is any movement of the pencil, really. Okay. Yeah. Draw, drawing is if you're if you've got a mop and you're and you're working on the side of a barn making marks. You know, you're. you're you're, you, you're scribbling with the pen, whatever it is. I'm just trying to think of ridiculous way. People would, you take a plow and in the field and you make lines, you're drawing. You're drawing the plow along, this kind of thing. Like drawing is a mm -hmm. much more general thing. That's why when people say they can't draw, it's kind of, they think they, it mo usually all, most often means they don't believe they can render well, or they don't believe they can uh -huh. render in a way that it will look like photorealistic. It's kind of like like we put our we put it so narrowly how we judge ourselves. Very rendering can be very loose and be very beautiful. The impressionists are a great example for sure. There, the haystacks you know bring people to tears. You know that story. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I really yeah. do. <laughs> yeah, that's a beautiful that's beautiful rendering. Yeah, and 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 it, and a completely kind of emotional thing. But we tend to think of rendering as a, a type thing. 
Uh, something else I had, I don't know. Kind of, kind of got toward the end. Okay, so I should say, um, I'm available uh, if people want to do individual readings. Uh, people hung out uh, after class uh, and um, we did some readings last week, which was fun. There's also the drawing, uh, uh, there's, there's I think on Friday nights a drawing bee, but anyway, if somebody wants to do readings in more of a group, if it's more comfortable, uh, we can organize that. Uh, it's important to do even if you just write it down for yourself, it's sometimes good to do with another person, but even if you write it down for yourself, it's, it's equally important to making the drawings is to, is to do a, just a, even the littlest bit of reading. Even if you just note uh, what you think is persistent in the drawings, because that's ultimately what becomes important. If you, if you look back at a week of drawings and you try to figure out what was kind of constant in those drawings, what was persistent in those drawings, that's a, that's a good way to read them. You know, that, that's what will come out in the readings eventually. And, that's, that, and then we turn our attention to that and we unpack that and we think about the, what, what the meaning is, we make a story about it. And like I say, for me, it, it takes um, sometimes months, sometimes years. Uh, and, and, and it was surprising because I, it wasn't something I had anticipated. And so when it happened, it was surprising, but I'll have a story that I'll cling to about it and will motivate me uh, that will at some point unfold into a deeper meaning. And that, I think that's really uh, something uh, to look for. It could, could happen quickly and deeper meanings can happen even in one reading. You can get to something that you didn't see. Uh, so it builds, even, even in one time you can learn something. And every day that I make a drawing and read it, I learn something about what's going on. I try to sit down at night before I post onto iClock and, and at least read at least one drawing and think about what the, what the sort of deeper meaning and message is, but they build, it builds because then all those meanings sort of build up. I have to do a reading, but sort of at the end of time. Okay. But, uh, so I, so does somebody have a drawing that they want to read? Did they bring a drawing? Did you bring one, Terry? Actually, I went through them and I found one that wasn't rendering. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I do have a drawing. Okay. So let's do one because it's good to have an example. And if people need to leave, we might go a little past nine if I understand, but we'll. Can you see that? Yeah, I see it. Awesome. I've got, uh, I, pinned, I pinned your video now, so I have you. Oh, okay. All right. Well, so maybe I should. Huh? Yeah. Hold it up so people can see it while you're doing it, if you can. And then just, you start with uh, like a physical description. Okay, well, I need to see your pin. Can I do that? Because I can't see the drawing. Oh, okay. So just a turn. You can, I think you can pin yourself, actually. Really? Okay. Yeah. Oh, I am. Okay. Okay. Cool. okay. <laughs> so I, there's questions. Uh, there's four or five questions yeah. I'm supposed to ask myself. I have them written down. Yeah, I can give them to you. Okay. Um, is it fi uh, the physical description, right? That's, right? That's right. Okay, so it's uh, it's marker pins. I think they're alcohol marker pins um, on uh, Bristol paper and um, in primary colors, basically. How's that? Uh, okay, so it's a, what size of the paper? Oh, um, five by eight, maybe. Okay. Uh, so you could say that there's a, um, almost complete rectangular shape in black in the center. Oh, is that part of above the center? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And there appears to be a red, uh, road into okay. the rectangular shape so yeah so we should that's a thing to note. that's one thing you look for in this phase is like that you use the word road there uh-huh see and that's already uh, uh like a story part yeah well so, i'm trying not to get there yeah, but yeah, yeah no it's just a, it's just interesting to note that you that you have already in this in this level you already been assigned meaning to that so anyway yeah so there's this uh i'd say i don't know what bent rectangle of red something like that outlined in black 
Oh, okay, I see. Uh huh. With some um, squiggly lines on the left hand side leading yeah. up to yeah. it. And there is sort of like a Payne's gray or a uh, gunmetal gray uh, block of color in an organic shape on the right hand side, yeah, good. which is there's also a blue uh, rectangular shape on, on that block of color. And then on the left side, there is uh, more neutral colors. There's a neutral brown and a neutral green. And um, in two blocks of color. Yeah. Good. Yeah, so when I'm, when I'm listening, I'm listening for like the, the choice of words, of color description where you put what you see, what you put your emphasis on, yeah, whether you've associated meaning to it already, that kind of thing. I think those are- Okay, well- so um, that, That's good. There's a mixture of sort of hard lines and soft edges, that kind of thing in the drawing. Yes, there is. There's a combination on the left-hand side with the neutral colors. The uh, strokes are a lot softer and- um, and uh, they're not in hard edges. Um, and above the, the shapes, there is the, uh, 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 a sun gold yeah. yellow uh, that's up there in the corner. And um, above the the hard black line of the rectangle that's in the direct center. So that's, is good. that description? Yeah, that's okay. very good. That was awesome. Oh yeah, so next is- uh, is uh, Sensory feelings, not emotions, how yeah. it impacts our sen senses. Right. All right, it, it impacts my senses. Well, I like it. I mean, it, it seems balanced, is that? Yeah. An impact. That's yeah. fair. Yeah, that's a sense. There's a sense of okay. balance. Okay. I like the contrast of the black going around the central rectangle. Uh, and I, I, it all also gives me a feeling of depth to, uh, okay. uh, that, 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 that center re rectangle is something that I can go into. So is there any audio uh, involvement or, or textural feel, visual textural feel for it in there for you? Well, I'm more olfactory. There's okay. kind of a smell to it. There's that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's normal, but um, yeah, it just smells uh, real inviting. It smells fresh. So um, I love that. I love that it has a smell. When you say that, I see a forest there in the, in the green or something like that, but maybe an ocean but, too. I don't know. Yeah, that's, a, that's that's the next part. That's interpretation. But but the sm smell, just the thought of smell in that gave me some ideas when you said that. The um, so thought and emotions and story. Yeah. So now you tell the story of the pi picture. Now you confabulate. You do that. Okay. What is, what is it a picture of? Kind of thing. What did you say? Confabulate. Confabulate. Yeah. We we put our senses together, like what we see and and all that, into a story. Now we tell a story about. Okay. It. I love it that I learn all these words. It's like in English class. Okay. <laughs> so um. Well, it, it, oh, the, the feeling that I got from it was a feeling of that I'm, oh, this is a little bit exposure, exposure, but my feeling was that I wasn't going to be stuck in the physical reality that um, I would be able again to come into uh, a wide open 
space of clarity and um, unbounded and unlimited spiritual place again. Mm. And um, so uh, the red road is, um, is in American Indian idiom, it is, uh, it means right living. And through right living, I feel like there will be, there is a, a place of, it represents it like a door or a window to go through the, the yellow rectangle and that red road is the pathway to it of right living and there's like um on the far right a blue uh a blue kind of flag and i feel like it's like a flag on a racetrack and it and i just and then on the left hand side and and then the the right hand side just feels very worldly like the like you know racing around uh on asphalt you know mm. um doing the normal things that it is in our worldly lives to uh survive and live you know work uh, driving to school doing this and that anyway that's what all that represents to me it's like mm. it's like being lost or being totally submerged in the world. And the left-hand side really re represented to me uh, the, the, the organic part of life, uh, the natural part of life. Mm. And that red road going into that bright light is um, to me just a sort of a beckoning and like, keep going, keep going. You're, mm. you're, it's okay. Just keep going. So, so you got a real inside. Uh, <laughs> it's amazing. So yeah, first of all, th thank you for sharing all that. That was, that was really tremendous. And to be, to be clear, how much of that, any of that story were you thinking of when you were making the None. Absolutely that, see, none. That's the, none that's amazing. Uh, see, I think it's amazing. That's what it, that it, that it evokes some some state that's familiar to you that's coming through in this other way some some desires or some worldview or so you can't really say what it is a slice of something that you're feeling yeah that can be transmitted and then put into the story so that was beautifully done okay well i don't know about the larger picture extract universal point what's oh i guess that was kind of in there right it was a lot of that in there for sure. Yeah, you were kind of kind of okay. mixed it too. But you could say this is a this is a symbol of uh, this is a symbol of um, of uh, uh, practice, continued practice. This is a, a beacon for uh, for moving oh, forward. I like that. Beacon, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that you have that I, you have this balance that's going on. It's almost like the two hemispheres, and this road is the way you're going to be in in the middle way between them, going into this frame, this enframed gold world, something like this. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> yeah, that's how I feel about it. Yeah, that's beautiful reading. So, yeah, thank you. Super, super. That's how it's done. That was textbook. That was really great. I love that. Uh, and and you know, like you do a meditation, you take a you take a meditation class, and you do a meditation. You can get something out of that meditation, but you don't get. I mean, you don't become enlightened in one meditation. Or if you're, you know if you're like me at least but but you do it and you learn from it and maybe you discuss your meditation with the teacher and then you go back and you meditate and it's about doing that practice about that you 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 can see you can reflect it's a very important part to sort of sort of catch up and see where you are touch base see where your position and that's what the reading is really part of it really helps with that and i think over time when you make these readings and you sort of your, your path drawing your own path <laughs> your, it helps you find that path those drawings are your markers and the reading of them is like reading the map and then you go back and you explore some more territory and then you read the map of that territory and then you go and explore some more and then it gradually pictures uh, come together even they come together in one and you get so much out of it but it doesn't cover the whole thing and you continue and uh, again, if you're enjoying it and it's pleasure in doing it, then that's, that's, uh, that's where you are. That's what keeps it going.
for me, it's a surprise every day that I can't wait to see. Wow. Yeah. So that was awesome. Thank you. Well, Love well what I want to say in closing is that the reason I picked that is it's because there was no mind involved in it. And I have at this point, I have a whole basket of daily drawings, but there's very, very few, less than five that have no mind connected to it. So yeah, but it's it's still worth it if there's mind to it to to read them. I'd I'd say it, it, it's a good. You you will get you will get more surprise and you will sometimes reveal a, a sentiment more sentiment or more deeper guidance from. But sometimes, uh, like like uh, in meditation, people have when you have a, a trouble in meditation. Uh, it's often useful to turn to that resistance to to not to say oh i'm 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 very nervous today and very turbulent but it's turning toward that and accepting that and letting that unfold which actually gets you through it so so if you have ones that are mindy sometimes it's worth it to read them and see what it is that's that's keeping you there it's or what you're up. thinking yeah okay. what's coming up in that too so i wouldn't disregard them for reading but yeah, right. I, I love i love that you chose one that that didn't because the idea that you got all that story and, and relevant to, to yourself and such a beautiful story out of something that that you that just appeared, I think is really one of the great the beauties of the practice. So I, I like that you did that. Well, thank you. Okay. Um, I knew I was going to expose myself, so <laughs> it was. Uh, I just jumped in. Okay. We, I appreciate it. <laughs> That's a vulnerability. On. I try to make the space comfortable for that. And, and it does make yeah. it sometimes a little bit uh, difficult to do in a group. But I also think it's strong in a group to do it because uh, when we did it in our workshops, I think Wendy was at one of them and we did it. We had three, four or five people at that workshop and everybody started to chime in and then it became this really dynamic thing. And everybody was oh. getting their own reading from everybody else's drawing, you know, because you could see what someone else saw in it. <laughs> uh huh. I mean, you, uh -huh. you have somebody read read something you wrote if you write a screenplay or a poem or something and then other people read it and then they tell you what they thought of it and you go, oh my goodness I never thought it can happen with the drawings as well you can learn a lot from that so uh, we we will continue uh, with readings when we can and if you have if you want one again let me know or if you want to work with other people that's cool uh, next week we go to uh, a, a map of the path. This is it's the it's the interpretation of the Zen ox herding pictures. Uh, <gasps> for oh creativity. yes, okay. yes. <laughs> oh great. So we, re, we reinterpret the ox herding pictures as a as a, it's a it's a classic map of enlightenment. It's a classic path to enlightenment that's been taught for I don't know hundreds and hundreds of years. But, but, and so there's this big cycle that it, that it takes, these Xenox herding pictures takes you to, uh, to enlightenment. Mm -hmm. But in the microcosm, you can look at it as just the start to the end of a drawing. You can see the whole path, creative path, and just oh. in that simple path. So we'll look at it in a parallel. We'll look at it as a, as a drawing path and as a, at some of its larger teachings. That's a, there are books and books on that too, but, but it's a great, and I like it because it's a, it's a set of drawings. It's visual representation mm -hmm. of the path. So we can look mm -hmm. and interpret the drawings. And again, you can get feelings and connections from drawings that you can't just get from words. So the, the drawings of the Xenox drawings are really nice, nice to look at. So we'll do that next time. Uh, so I'm gonna close it and turn off the recording. Uh, thank you everybody for being here. It's really a pleasure. And uh, I hope to see you again next week. And uh, uh, thank you again. John. Bye, John. Thanks, John. Bye, everybody. Thanks, John. Thank you. Bye, everybody.